Welcome to more course on introduction to proteogenomics. After getting a glimpse of proteogenomic concepts by Dr. David Fenu, we will now move on to the next step of understanding the sequence centric proteogenomics by Dr. Kelly Ruggles. Dr. Kelly will talk about the basic workflow and requirements of sequence centric proteogenomics. She will also talk about the reference databases like RefSeq, Uniprot and Ensemble. She will also talk about the gene annotation and if genomic data capable of facilitating the search of novel peptide or identification of functional proteins. So, let us welcome Dr. Kelly Ruggles to know the answers of some of these interesting important questions and also to understand the sequence centric proteogenomics approaches. We are going to talk now about sequence centric proteogenomics. And so what, but what do we mean by this, right? So what does this mean? This just means we are really focusing on the, sequ the sequencing data in terms of what um, information we get from it like the, the SNVs, the indels, the fusions, the splice junctions, which is what you know, I discussed yesterday, and trying to combine, the, use this information to get more information out of our proteomics data. So, whether that means genome annotation, which I'll talk about in, in, in detail, or looking at the actual mutation analysis, specifically in tumor samples. Um, and you can also use this for metaproteomics, but this is um, outside of the scope. So this is something that we do work on, but it's in the microbiome. So um, there are a couple of requirements to this. Um, you, of course, need DNA or RNA sequencing. If you have both, you can use both in different ways. Um, some sort of high resolution mass spec data and then the, the actual tools to combine these um, and we'll talk about some of those um, later on in the session. And just as a review, I know you've heard this a bunch of times, but um, I want to really focus in on the, the importance of the protein sequence database. So I want to touch on it a little, a couple of slides of, about that. So when we're doing pro, uh, protein identification and quantification by mass spec, Right, we have our sample um, fractionation digestion, you have peptides, you run them on the mass spec. And then in order to actually identify them, you need a protein sequence database, or you can be like Carl and do it by hand, but let's assume that we don't we want to have the protein sequence database. Um, so from our database, so this is something like RefSeq um, or Uniprot, you, your, the algorithm will pick a protein, do an in silico digestion, um, pick a peptide, and then have the fragment masses here and do a comparison test and um, test for the significance. And we'll continue to do this over and over again. Um, but of course, if your peptide or your protein is not in this database, you're never going to find it. Um, so there, this is a very important thing that sequencing can help us really make sure we have the right sequences in our database. Um, and so uh, databases with these missing peptide sequences will fail to be identified. And if we make our database too big, you know, sometimes people will say, well, why don't you just put everything you could possibly put in it, then we're going to lose sensitivity. So we don't want to do that either. So really, we want to make sure the database is small um, but complete. So ideally, it would contain all of the proteins that you expect to see in the sample, but nothing else. Obviously, that's not usually not going to happen, but you want to get as close as you can to that, right? So the example of reference databases I already mentioned are RefSeq and Uniprot and Ensemble. Um, there are more. But um, th so I don't know how many of you know about the New York City Marathon. I was just watching it recently, and so I wanted to make a, um, a comparison between this and the marathon. Um, so this is what the marathon looks like. There's 50,000 people running in the streets. And I was looking for one person, a friend of mine, who really wanted me to see him. This is very hard to do. <laughs> so I'm searching for Mike. So he's the peptide. The marathons are database. So will I find Mike? So one, is he running the marathon? That's important. If he's not, then I'm wasting my time, right? So is he in the database? Is the peptide in the database at all? Um, two, how many people who look exactly like Mike or very close to Mike are also running in the marathon? Um, the answer to that was a lot. It was very hard for me to find him. <laughs> but it, so if you add more and more people, right, can, can I find the right peptide if there are too many unrelated ones in the database? So the perfect 
ideal database here would be just Mike running through the streets of New York. I would obviously find him. So uh, I, this just happened to me, so I thought it was, a, it, it was a, a nice example of why we have to make our databases really the best that we can to find um, the peptides of interest. So the first example I'm going to talk about is genome annotation, so using sequencing data for genome annotation. Um, this is not cancer specific, but this is just another use that I think a lot of people in the room may, may end up using in their work, so I wanted to mention it. So what is genome annotation? Um, it is the process of identifying and assigning functions to genes. So um, the human the genome has been fairly well annotated, the mouse genome, Drosophila, all of our favorite model organisms, but there's tons of organisms out there, right, that have not been annotated. So if you're working on one of those, this may be a really good way of, of trying to help further annotate your, your, um, your genome. So historically, there's been some, there's been software and models that have been developed to try and predict genes from, um, from genomes. And those are okay, um, but they're not perfect. And we'll talk about um, how some of them can fail in a little bit of detail. I'm not going to go into too much detail. Um, also, RNA transcripts. Transcriptome analysis is, of course, really important here, but to really understand what's making it to the protein level, you have to do proteomics. So um, for really good genome annotation, proteomics um, and proteogenomics is, is really important. Um, so uh, really, proteomics has been used in several instances to supplement our sequence analysis to really get the best genome annotation we can. Um, so we can use mass spec data to confirm gene models, to correct gene models, and to also identify novel genes and splice isoforms. So here's an example, and I'm sorry you can't read this. Um, I will, oh, you can here, great. Okay, so, um, so the green here would be our predictive models, where they, it takes the sequence and it predicts what actually is an exon, essentially. Um, you can see, so here's the actual annotation, so you can see that it's missing a whole lot of things, right? Um, so it's, it doesn't have the right transcriptional start site, um, it only has one transcript, it doesn't have um, this, the 5 prime um, exon, it doesn't have the UTRs, so it's missing a lot of information. Um, now if we add in RNA-seq data, we end up finding at least that there are two isoforms here. Um, but then when we add in proteomics, we figure out what's actually making it to the protein, right? So then we can find out where the start codon is, we can un better understand where the UTRs are. So merging all this information together is really necessary to correctly annotate um, genomes. So um, how do we do this? So we have our reference database or whatever we have available. So, so if there's so a lot of databases um, for understudied organisms that kind of exist, but they're incomplete, so you can use that. And then if you do a sequence, you could do a, a whole genome sequence of whatever organism you want, and then you just do a six frame translation, we'll talk about what that is, and add that in. And then you can from that find new peptides in, in that will supplement what we already know about, about the organism's annotation. Right, so here is what, so we have our sequence. So you do a positive strands, three frame translations. So, you know, you start at ATG and you go from there, G, TGA and you go from there. So you do every, um, every frame and then you go in the negative direction and then you get the other three frames. So then you have six frames and then you can use this uh, to supplement your reference database. Um, this is, if, the only the, the, be, the best way to go if you don't have RNA-seq data and, um, you know, because you're really, you're blowing up your database. You're making it enormous if you do this. So it's not necessarily the best thing to do if you have other, other data available that we'll talk about, but it is one option, especially when you're working with like an understudied organism and you only have whole genome sequencing. So if you have RNA-seq data, as I mentioned, then you can add in splicing information, which will be even more, it will help you annotate even, even further. Um, and if you, um, let's say you want to study an organism that has no genome sequence, so zebras don't have a, their, their sequence genome, uh, their genome sequence, I checked last night. 
there's a whole bunch of organisms that don't. But um, let's say you want to study zebras and you are interested in this, but you don't have anything about it. Well, you could, you could use a horse. It's close enough. Um, and you can try and see what you find using the horse se sequence to see if you're able to find um, interesting um, related proteins. And then you can do some de novo sequencing as well to try and supplement this. So this is an option. Um, is anyone studying zebras? <laughs> Um, so one example, a recent example um, of this, this type of method was um, in the, the pig genome. So in 2017, there's this paper that came out, you can find it. Um, if you're interested, you can go look at it, where the pig genome had been recently sequenced, um, but the actual annotation of the genome had, was not complete. So they used mass spec. Um, they did mass spec on nine organs during different stages of development. And then they were able to improve the annotation for over 8,000 protein coding genes. So I think this is like the perfect example of how you can use these two things together to really better annotate genomes. And here's the list of their databases. So they use all sorts of sequence databases. Um, they use prediction models. They use six frame translations of the genome. Um, they use transcriptome data. So they kind of did all of the things we already talked about. So I think it's a really nice example of how you can use this data for annotation. Any questions about annotation? I'm going to move into, go ahead, yeah. So I'm working on the model organism other than human. Yeah. So for which I don't have the whole genome sequence, but I have the whole genome sequence for related species. So I'm identifying the protein. So how this will be useful that whatever genome information will be there from related species and then using for the, my target species. So you have similar situation to the zebra. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so <laughs> and you want, so. so I'm giving one example. I'm working on fish. Okay. Which is closely related to zebra fish. Uh -huh. Then you also species. But then you the whole genome sequence is available. But where in the case of this species, which is closely related to that, the whole genome sequence is not available. So I'm trying to identify the protein using relative database. Then again, I'm going for suppose proteogenomics. Yeah. How this will be ready? So I mean, can you do sequencing on your species? That would be the best thing to do. But if you can't, uh, yeah, I, I have you tried to use a related species database? Yeah, that's what I'm doing. If I'm doing that, then how will it be ready? How much validity will be there? Depends on how related they are. Um, so we could talk about it offline. This is an interesting. We could we could chat about the, this exact question, but it really depends, right? Um, I know David Fenya was working on rat and mouse work that was similar to this, so he may also be a good person to talk to about it. <coughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. The that is the most common uh, model zebra fish. Yeah. So they are, uh, how close is they are related? Is that they belong to the same family? That's why we chose them. We have chosen this, and uh, most of the information available is for this related fish only. So it's asking that. Uh, okay. How much it means uh, uh, validate? Validate how uh, how it is validated or not? If we use proteomics using the same genomic uh, data of the other uh, like zebra fish. It's not perfect, right? Like yeah, you're going to be missing a lot of information, but I think it's worth trying. And I, I and I don't know how similar your species are, right? So it's hard for me to say, but I think it's worth. It sounds like you're already going to do it. So you might as well try. You can let me know how it works, and then we can talk about it. <laughs> Yeah, it, yeah, like it's very case by case, right? So, yeah. Uh, conservation scores to narrow down the bit of protein coding region. Conservation scores on the protein coding region. Is that what you said? Yes. What about it? Reduce the regions which are like protein coding. If the yeah, so you can you can predict what would be protein coding. Uh, yes, correct. Like yes. 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 Correct. 
Is that, I don't know what the question was, but I agree with what you said. <laughs> Okay, other questions? Move on? Okay. So I'm gonna spend most of the time talking about variant identification, so variant peptide identification. So what do we mean by this, the novel peptide identification? So what, um, the questions we wanna answer here are whether or not genomic SNPs are translated into functional proteins. So when we have a single nucleotide polymorphism, does it make it to the protein? And if it does, do we see it at the protein level? Um, and also, do we see novel protein expression? Um, I'm going to be specifically really looking at tumors in this case, but you could apply this to whatever you're, you know, what, whatever you're looking at. Um, it's just typically in tumors there is, um, there, you see more of this um, novel expression, so it's something that we, we pay a lot of attention to. Um, so here, um, this would be looking at different RNA-seq splice junctions, which we talked about yesterday, so things, and we'll talk about all of the different sort of combinations of splice junctions that are novel and how we deal with them um, in terms of proteomics. There are a, lot, a couple different kinds of, of SNPs. Um, so if we have, these are our codons, if we have no mutation, we get a lysine. If we have a synonymous SNP where there's a G to A, but it doesn't actually change the, um, the amino acid. We can have non-synonymous SNPs where it turns into a stop codon, so it will just stop the, the protein synthesis early. Um, or we can have a missense mutation where we actually get a complete change in the, in the, um, the amino acid. And we'll talk about these. Um, in more detail. So, um, so we're really going to focus on how do, we, how do we put these peptides, how do we get them into our database so we can even find them. Um, so, and one of the reasons this is really important is because um, there have been several studies that, um, well, so most proteomic studies that have been done, especially previously, we've gotten better about this, um, is that they usually use a reference database. So either RefSeq or Uniprot to model wh whomever. Um, but as we talked about yesterday, a reference database is just um, trying to represent the population, but it doesn't have all of the different um, variation that occurs in a population. So, um, and there was this um, Thousand Genomes Project, which we also talked about yesterday, that really uncovered how, how much variation there is person to person. Um, and they're not necessarily disease-causing SNPs, they're just SNPs we just, that exist. Um, so if we model everyone using a reference database, we're going to miss a lot of information. Um, and also, in cancer, there are somatic mutations that occur, so, so mutations that are just occurring in the tumor. So if you're trying to measure proteins in a tumor, um, and you don't include these somatic SNPs, you may actually miss those peptides. And the, these are really, um, really interesting because many of them act as, as um, they're very much involved in disease progression. So if we use a reference, we can't find these SNPs in our data. So we really need to figure out how to make sure we include them in our data so that we can find these um, to uncover both patient, if, it's, if we're looking at cancer, um, and tumor-specific variation. So, for example, if we have our, our mass spec flow, um, if we have germline mutations, so these are just mutations occurring in, in people, and somatic mutations occurring in the tumor itself, we have to figure out how to get these into the database so that we can actually find them. So this is just a representation of the same, same thing. So, um, the, there's, uh, the VCF file format is the most commonly used format um, for looking at these variants. In, um, I uploaded, these are the columns again, we have the chromosome, the position of the SNP, um, an identifier, so sometimes there's not, not really anything there, it's just a dot, the reference amino uh, nucleotide, and then the, um, the new um, nucleotide, and then a quality score, and then some other information um, about, about the SNP itself. Many times when you look at variant calling, uh, yeah. it's mentioned that it's true variant, etc. But when you actually do PCR verification, you find that actually it's a false. Yes. So what is the criteria by which you can actually pick out true variants from? 
I mean, the best way is to do PCR val verification. Yeah, yeah, um, so there are a lot of ways of validating it. Um, one of them is, is that way. So it just depends on the study, how much work a person is willing to do to, to validate. If you have hundreds and hundreds of them, you can't do that. So that's why I mentioned yesterday that there are several SNP callers. So right now, a lot, what a lot of people do is they will use a whole bunch of them and then look at the overlap and then trust the overlap versus just using one because you're going to have a lot of false positives. And that seems to work fairly well. In conclusion, I hope today you have learned how one can use gene annotation and genome sequencing to create the proteome databases for unexplored organism type. I would like to emphasize it is very crucial to learn this information because many times you are working on the unknown organisms for which databases are not available and therefore your searches are going to revert back with unknown or hypothetical proteins. So refining databases is very crucial especially if you are not working on the human and other model systems. So you may have to first try to establish good databases for doing the search for proteomics data. You also learned why it is better to know your targets while searching for SNPs single nucleotide polymorphism as you do not want to sequence non pathogenic SNPs in this process. We also heard about how one could make the personalized protein databases for specific studies. The next lecture is about variant analysis and their effect on RNA and protein expression in clinical conditions. Lecture will be continued by Dr. Kelly Regals. Thank you.